see, one of the most important steps for a parent with a child with autism is to stop mourning the child that they thought they had and start embracing the child that they have. It's, it's interesting because initially the label is difficult because as a parent you don't know what that means. What does that mean for your child that they're autistic? What does that mean for their future? So I would say if you have a child that's not speaking, that's a red flag, a child that's not looking at you, a child that's not playing with another child, those are a red flag, a child that becomes obsessed with say a toy, um, a particular object, um, being obsessed in sitting on this chair only, those are key to look at. at I had a kid once who would only eat a cereal if it's lined up in a row. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven cards, amazing. Kai, now it's your turn, ready? Give me, the girl is drinking milk. Amazing, what is she doing? Drinking. Drinking milk. Milk, good job. Give me, the boy, let's put this one down, ready, quiet hands. The girl is brushing her hair. You got it, fantastic. What is the girl doing? Brushing hair. Brushing hair, awesome, like this. Show me, yep, you brush. Every child is affected differently. Some people are affected with all of the different disabilities and some kids might have one or two of them. You know, so you have to assess the child accordingly and then tailor the education for each specific child. It, every human being on this planet is as important as the next one. So why do we cast these aside? They need, they need more help, we're in the position to do it, we should do it. It's, it. It should be, you know, in the state of Ireland, it's said that if you're born into the state of Ireland that you're entitled to a free education. Why can't the child be entitled to a free appropriate education to your specific needs? Yes, it's more expensive on the short term, on the long term, the state would save a fortune because if you give these children the appropriate intervention they need at the right stage of their life, they won't be as dependent on the state when they get older yes. as an adolescent or a young adult in, 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 in residential care or respite, which costs an absolute fortune. You know, they, they, they can be taught the skills they need to survive in our society a lot of the time. Going back 20 years ago when we hadn't got the, the intelligence that we have now, I understand. But now that we do understand and we have got the intelligence, it's, it's an absolute crime that the government and the Board of Education and the Board of Health don't recognise this and give these children a fighting chance. Isabella was diagnosed, she met all her milestones, but around two years old, we realised that she didn't have any words. And uh, we talked to our paediatrician about the fact that she was developing normally, but didn't have language. And the, my, our pediatrician suggested that maybe because she was bilingual, maybe she was confused as to which language she should be using, which to me just analytically didn't make sense because if a person is listening to two languages, you would think they would say something in either language. And she wasn't saying anything, not mom, not dad, nothing. And so um, we had to confront the fact that maybe something was wrong. And so we started to take her to um, specialist and it took about three, three visits, uh, three observations, three evaluations to really have to understand that she was autistic. And the first time that we heard it, they're like, no, something must be wrong because she didn't seem that, that anything was wrong with her, with the exception of language. Yeah. So we just kept going to different doctors to see whether that, the diagnosis would be different. But by the third time, we, we knew that we had to accept what that meant. He's loving it, look, they love the cameras. <laughs> All the children love the camera equipment. That's what I realized. Abdul, Abdul, yes, we went to somewhere and the camera, the boy just couldn't, it was just cheese. Cheese! <laughs> right now my dream for Gavin is to see him going to a regular high school, want to see him him doing the exam, pass his exam, go to high school, go to college. That's my dream. So I would love to see if the government could intervene and have like a school where we have integration where they would no. sit with normal kids and you know. Well they will always live with us, even as we get older and become old. People, they will always be with us in our eyes. They will never be leaving the home. This is their home. This is their home. We see it that we live here with them. You know, everything is about them. Um, we, we work towards, along with school, making them as independent as possible. So they can do as many things as they can, like Lucas and I'll drink out of an open top cup. 
Which at 11, you think, well, they should have been doing that years ago, but that's took like all them years to get him to drink out of an open top cup, but he's doing it now and f- kind of feeding themselves. We'd, we'd love to have them toilet trained, wouldn't we, for, yeah. for their own sake, but... The, the biggest thing that we would love to hear is basic language. Yeah. The, the biggest thing for us is to hear those words, Dad, that is massive to us. You know, parents take that for granted, you know, but for us to hear just those words, Dad, would be huge to us. It would be absolutely massive. If we could get the boys to kind of say dad or if they tell us they're in pain because when they are poor and they're in pain a lot of it is guesswork all the time to try and isolate where the pain is and see what kind of pain it is so amy as a parent is this is this how what normally happens when you take him to the barbers yes yeah. How often does he come here? Uh, he was here four or five weeks ago. Yeah. And what is it he doesn't like? Do you know? Does he tell you? It's the years. It's different people. It's different situations. He's petrified of a haircut. Doesn't like it at all. Sit with my hands. Sit with my hands. Yes. And then we see Nana. No. No. You better do one. You do one. Yeah. Watch now. Look. Watch now. Look. Ready. See? See? Look. Brother, actually, don't hurt. Um, like I say, obviously, the first thing they ever started, obviously, was a year ago with um, little boy Mason. Um, he, just came, he, he came into my shop just on a, a day, day-to-day basis, and his parents obviously had heard that I was obviously good working with kids. Um, obviously I knew, obviously when they said he had autism, obviously I knew I had to approach in a different manner. And did you know anything about <laughs> autism though? No, nothing. <laughs> nothing, like I say, I had one, it was one boy who came previously, um, eat this boy Ethan, and he, had, he used to have like caps on his ears and I taught him how to get over, overcome that fear. Um, so again, I had a brief idea of how to go about it. Um, but obviously I, I knew I had to spend months with me, so obviously due to his sensory issues. Seven, eight. Nine, ten. Good boy. Well done. Good boy. Good boy, Jacob. So many services are tied to the label. And I do a lot of public speaking about autism, and I know a lot of parents who have autistic children but are not yet ready to say that they're autistic. And what do you think that is? I think there's shame. I think there is embarrassment. I think for me there's guilt. There was guilt. You start to think, well, did I do something to to produce this autism? And in my family, we are a very special family because there's three daughters, and we have five children amongst the three of us. Four of them are autistic. So there seems that there's a genetic component of it, but, but, but because there's so much mystery surrounding autism, no one really knows what causes it, where did it come from. There's so much discussion about sh- uh, whether the vaccines cause it, whether the vaccines don't cause it. But I've come to a point in my life where it doesn't really matter what caused it. What matters is that it's here. Hey, a lot of them love the bar now. And then they're fascinated by its eyes, especially the autistic children, that's what they say, its eyes, I want to see its eyes. It's interesting, isn't it? Because yeah. as you say, they don't like to have direct contact. So that's, that's right, yeah. That's quite interesting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I, I, I think maybe a, as well it could be a case of um, the, like, the animal, it's not judging in any way or it's not, you know, it's, it's easy for them. Because what else I've noticed with autistic children, they tend to, like, they, be, they can associate more with younger kids or kids in the same situation rather than kids a child their age that's not autistic so to speak especially with my lad that's the same effect with, with him he, he can bond with younger kids or autistic children himself but he, he won't bond with anyone else the biggest thing about being a special needs parent is that you're always waiting for that glimmer of hope that they're in there that you're connecting with them that they understand you that they know how much you love them even if they can't really communicate with you and you're trying desperately to communicate with them so those are the breakthroughs that i live for well the parents number one have to stay positive 
you know, it, the parents are the people that get things done. That's the way it's happened in the past. That what that's what's working. So you have to look at what works and try to drive that forward and hope to kind of drag people along with you along the way. Um, so in my opinion. I think you, we have to keep on fighting for what they need, try to put in place what we can ourselves, fundraise to get the money to do it if that's what we need to do, and just, and just be the voices for those people that have none.